All right, folks, welcome. My name is Shaylin Ameo, and I'm the Public Engagement Manager for Connecticut Landmarks. I will be your moderator today. We are using the webinar setup of Zoom today, so you do not need to worry about muting yourself or turning your camera off. If you would like to submit a question for our speaker, please do so using the Q&A function at the bottom of your window. If you need assistance, you can select my name, CTL Shaylin, in the chat feature. Connecticut Landmarks is a statewide network of historic house museums that shares 400 years of New England history. Our historic properties inspire an understanding of our complex past to help create a state whose people move forward together as one. Today's program is part of our Landmarks Lunch and Learn virtual lecture series presented the second Wednesday of each month, June to November at noon. Make deeper connections to the history of our people, buildings and landscapes through this series. See the full lineup on our website, ctlandmarks.org, and I will also drop the link in the chat now. Today's program focuses on one of our properties, the Nathan Hale Homestead. The Nathan Hale Homestead has been working to consider the legacy of one of America's first and best known spies who also had an incredibly short career. In recent years, adjustments to the interpretation connect Nathan Hale's life in the Continental Army with efforts made by his family at the homestead to support the war effort and highlight the contributions of the women in his family in addition to the men. The homestead also works to honor community members who have served more recently by developing programs and temporary exhibits in collaboration with them. And now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Anne-Marie Charland began working at the Nathan Hale Homestead as an interpreter in 2012. From 2014 to 2017, she was the site's director of education, formalizing and expanding the school programs offered there. In 2017, she moved into the site administrator role, overseeing all aspects of operations and visitor experience. Anne-Marie loves to bring her experience visiting other history and tourism sites to her role at Connecticut Landmarks. She has also curated exhibits with the Wyndham Textile Museum and conducted genealogy research for clients throughout Connecticut. So now, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Anne-Marie, who's going to be doing our presentation today. Thank you so much for having me today, Shaylin and Connecticut Landmarks. Um, I, it, I think it's so much fun that we get to share some of the lesser known Hale family stories. Uh, it's also, I was just saying to Shaylin, a perfect setting today. Uh, we've got dark skies and uh, a, a very light roll of thunder in the background. It just seems like the perfect setting to discuss the witch trials of the 17th century. So before we get started, uh, I would just like to talk a moment about what life was like here in the 17th century in New England, in the New England colonies. Um, and some of the topics I'm about to discuss uh, are really, could, really could have played a small role in what actually caused the witch hysteria. Uh, People were being a, accused of being witches in New England almost as soon as European colonists arrived. In fact, between 1648 and 1663, 15 people were executed as witches throughout New England. Today, we are focusing on the more commonly known witch trials of 1692 in Salem, Massachusetts. As Reverend John Hale, who was Nathan Hale's great grandfather, was a key figure in these particular witch trials. The outbreak started in Salem Village, which you will see on this map. Uh, it has a 15 next to it which is now Danvers, Massachusetts. It soon spread to Salem Town, which is present day Salem. 
and it spread through Beverly, Topsfield, Andover. These were where the higher number of accusations were. You can see on the map 45 in Andover, Massachusetts alone. At this time, most of the towns highlighted here had they made up the Massachusetts Bay Colony and they had to meet once a meet once a week for prayer services and town services. Uh, it was a requirement. This was law for these people. Now imagine how hard it must have been for them to travel once a week to get to where Salem Town is on this map. By 1667, one by one, Swampscott, Manchester, Wyndham, Middleton, Topsfield, Beverly, Danvers, Peabody, Marblehead, and Salem separated from what was considered Salem Town, creating their own villages with their own meeting houses. So now they don't have to travel as far. The straw that broke the camel's back was when Salem Village decided to break away from Salem Town. Animosity grew between neighbor, neighboring farmers as some believed the areas should remain united. There was strength in being united. Salem Village did eventually successfully break away from Salem Town in 1673 and created their own parish. However, in a 16 year time period, Salem Village saw four ministers come and go, each minister leaving as a result of unpaid wages. Enter Samuel Paris. Samuel Paris was appointed minister of Salem Village in 1689. After many parishioners decided they were not fans of Reverend Paris, they decided it worked before. Let's just stop paying him and he will just go away. Did not work. As a result, he decided to scare his parishioners into paying him by preaching sermons filled with images of devils, evils, and tempting forces. In one of these sermons, he said, the devil hath been raised amongst us and his rage is vehement and terrible. In February, 1692, in the home of Reverend Paris, his daughter, Betty, age nine, and his niece, Abigail Williams, age 11, accused the Paris family slave, Tichaba, of witchcraft. At first, Tichaba denied any part in witchcraft, but after Reverend Paris reportedly beat her, threatened to torture her, and even threatened execution, if she did not admit to being a witch, Tichaba conf confessed to bewitching the girls. Now imagine the fear this woman must have been wrought with. She is far from her native land of Barbados, and she is being accused of witchcraft. She was a slave on the Paris plantation in Barbados, and she had recently been thrust into this new land, new climate, new culture. I suspect that this is truly what drove her confession. Betty and Abigail continued to accuse people within the community. They were convulsing in fits. A doctor was called in, but could not diagnose anything wrong with the girls. Neighboring ministers were then called in. John Hale being one of them. Remember, he is great-grandfather to Nathan Hale. Hale's testimony of these events included beyond the power of epileptic effects and natural disease to affect. So what he's saying here is there is nothing natural about this. This is not an illness. This is bewitchment. 
Reverend John Hale was born in Charlestown, Massachusetts. His father, Robert, was the local blacksmith. This was not John's first experience with witch accusations. As a 12-year-old boy, John Hale witnessed the execution of Margaret Jones, the first of 15 to be executed for witchcraft between 1648 and 1663 in New England. Hale was very open throughout his entire life, stating that he believed in what he called the invisible world. I just love this image. Hale attended Harvard. He became a teacher in the Church of Beverly, Massachusetts in 1667. Uh, he became a minister in Beverly, a position he held until his death in 1700. He became a prominent figure throughout the colony of Massachusetts. Now, note that in 1690, just two years before the witch hysteria began, Hale became a militia chaplain for a militia that was tasked with invading Canadian forts during the King William's War. Now, I note this because we often forget how many lives were lost during this period. An area as small as the Massachusetts Bay Colony would have been deeply affected by this war. Sons, brothers, husbands would have been lost, bringing more turmoil to these villagers' lives. Uh, they are going to have to regroup and women are going to have to pick up and try to run their farms without their husbands who have now been lost to the war. Uh, this is a tumultuous time in uh, our history. John Hale was married three times. His first marriage was to Rebecca Biley, with whom he had two children. Um, I did receive an email from someone uh, who said that they were coming to this today, who said that they were a direct descendant of Rebecca Biley. Um, the second wife was Sarah Noyes, with whom he had four children. Now this is the wife that the Hale family descends from and Elizabeth Clark, with whom he did not have any children. Now he is 56 years old when he is being faced with the witch hysteria. There is some evidence that the witch trials were brought on by ergot poisoning. Uh, this thought is that it was causing a mass hysteria. Uh, ergot is a fungus that grows in wheat and rye. See these brownish black spikes coming off of the sheath, um, of the, I mean, the top rather, of the wheat? That is the fungus. That is what it looks like. Um, it, it is known to grow in wheat and rye. Uh, early symptoms of the poisoning include nausea, vomiting, muscle pain, weakness, numbness, itching, and rapid or slow heartbeat. Ergot poisoning can progress to gangrene. Now listen to the following symptoms. Vision problems, convulsions, spasms, confusion, unconsciousness, and death. Sounds a little too familiar as to what's going on uh, during these trials. Uh, in 1951, a southern French village had 250 people affected by ergot poisoning. Uh, I remind you, I just said 1951, and the people of this village could not be convinced that this was anything other than witchcraft. Now, back to the Paris Parsonage with Betty and Abigail convulsing. Uh, 
imagine how impressionable uh, these youths were living in a house with a fire and brimstone minister ranting about the devil being amongst the community. Uh, personally, I think that there was the power of suggestion and they are receiving attention plus a couple of men behind the curtain uh, pulling the strings and putting these thoughts into the young girls' minds. Uh, accusations started with Tichaba and then moved on to Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne. All three are of low social status and there is really no one to vouch for the character of these women. They're easy targets. Soon, other young girls in the same age range join in making accusations, including Ann Putnam, whose family was very close with the Paris family. Interestingly, the first person she accuses is someone who her father is having a feud with. There were over 200 accusations in Massachusetts in the year 1692 alone. John Hale was involved in the interrogation of many of these people. He observed, he interrogated, and he testified as an expert witness in these trials. Much of the testimony of these girls is spectral evidence meaning that they were seeing things, hearing things, and experiencing things that no one else in the courtroom was experiencing. The magistrate was really worried that maybe they shouldn't be, be using the spectral evidence and how could they prove, if no one else can see it, how can they prove that these girls are not just making it up? So they called in Reverend John Hale, as well as um, two other ministers. And they asked them, what should we do about the spectral evidence? And John Hale, joined by the other two ministers, advises them, although we don't love using the spectral evidence, um, it's, what's, it's what we have. This is the proof that we have. And we should accept what the evidence is and where it leads us. So spectral evidence is allowed in the trials. One of the interesting cases was the case of Edward and Sarah Goody Bishop versus Christian Trask. Trask had made several complaints about the bishops having an unlicensed and loud tavern. Reverend Hale interceded, but the feud grew more and more hostile over the years. And eventually, poor Trask was found dead with a slit throat and a pair of scissors laying right by her side. Hale was called to view the body, and he was to decide, was it murder? Was it suicide? Reverend Hale ruled no to both of those options and claims clearly this is witchcraft. The bishops were not accused of witchcraft at the time, but in 1692, the couple was arrested as witches. Edward handled this arrest by stating that although he was innocent, he thought his wife was indeed a witch and that she stays up late at night and he's sure she's talking to the devil. The bishops somehow escaped the Salem jail and they went into hiding until the hysteria died down. Uh, I have looked into this couple and they did remain married um, and uh, no one killed the other one uh, until their deaths. Uh, but I just think how interesting that uh, Edward threw his wife under the bus so easily. 
Uh, a second very interesting case uh, during this time period that involved our, our Reverend John Hale uh, is the case of Dorcas Hoare. Now, Dorcas Hoare was known, was a very well-known character uh, throughout the Sa Salem and Beverly, Massachusetts areas. Uh, she was your stereotypical gypsy. I like to imagine her as uh, the, the gypsies we see in old movies. Uh, she was known, known to be a fortune teller. She picked pockets and she even ran a burglary ring. She, she started a cleaning service that included six youths, three adults, uh, they were going into people's homes and stealing their valuables. One of these homes was the home of Reverend John Hale. Uh, the Hale children later stated that they had witnessed Dorcas and the others stealing from the home, but they were too afraid to come forward. Hoare and members of the ring were eventually prosecuted in 1678, being that there were youths involved, John Hale intervened and he asked the court for leniency. He did not feel that it was fair that these youths who were led astray um, uh, were going to be prosecuted. And as a result, all involved, adults and youth, were sentenced not to the gallows, not to jail, uh, but they had to pay back everything that they had stolen. Uh, they had to pay fines equaling any material items that were stolen as well. Uh, the burglary ring did not look at what John Hale did for them as an act of kindness. And they retaliated by beating two of his cows, uh, severely injuring one and killing the other. 14 years pass and Dorcas Hoare is being, was being charged with witchcraft. And her fate depends on a character witness. Now, remember who is the expert witness through all of these witch trials, it is Reverend John Hale. Reverend John Hale evaluates the situation. He goes to the trial of Dorcas and she is convicted and sentenced to execution by hanging on September 22nd, 1692. Now, note that date. 84 years later, Reverend Hale's great-grandson, Nathan Hale, was executed by hanging on September 22nd, 1776. But on the eve of Dorcas Hoare's execution, she confessed that she was in fact a, wit a witch and that she wished to repent. Now, upon hearing this, Reverend Hale intervenes for Dorcas Hoare again, along with three other ministers, and they request on her behalf that her execution be postponed for one month so that she can prepare for her death by making amends with the Lord. Well, when that one month was over, the hysteria had passed, and Dorcas Hoare escaped execution. Now, a fun little side note is actress Jean Smart. Many of you probably know her from Designing Women, um, as well as many other things she has done. Uh, she is a direct descendant of Dorcas Hoare. Now, what ended the the hysteria. Hale's second wife, Sarah Noyes Hale, was accused of being a witch. Sarah is a well-respected woman in the community. This seems to be one of the key turning points in the trials. Uh, it, occurs, it occurs to the community that if Sarah Noyes could be accused, then any one of them could be 
accused. John Hale suddenly switches his opinion too. Uh, I guess it hit too close to home for him. Royal Governor Phipps decided that when all was said and done, he must have all evidence of the witch trials destroyed. He ordered all documents and publications mentioning the witch hysteria be banned. There were book burnings throughout Eastern Massachusetts, including Boston. Uh, there is documentation of these book burnings in Boston. Uh, it is the first large scale government cover up. Uh, here in the colonies. Uh, he is hiding the fact that so many innocent lives were lost. Uh, there are only two first account books dating to the actual period. Uh, more Wonders of the Invisible World, written in England by Robert Califf. Uh, he wrote this eight years after the hysteria. And that's why it still exists today. Uh, it waited a period of time before being published and he's on the other side of the pond. So he avoids the banning. And the other first account is John Hale's book, A Modern Inquiry into the Nature of Witchcraft, which he wrote two years after the hysteria but was not, it was not actually published until after his death in 1700. The book is his way of making amends for his role in the trials, uh, in apology for taking part in it all and for his hand in so many innocent souls being lost. Such was the darkness of that day. The tortures and lamentations of the afflicted and the power of former presidents that we walk, we walked in the clouds and could not hear our way. And we have most cause to be humbled for error on that hand, which cannot be retrieved, Reverend John Hale. Um, if you are looking for a copy of his book, we do carry it in the Hale gift shop. Um, but this really, this really was his role from beginning to end. He really had his hands in the trials from beginning to end. I hope you enjoyed our talk today. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Shaylin. Were there any questions? All right, hello, thank you so much for that uh, insight. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come through. Again, if anyone uh, watching the presentation has questions, you can drop them into the Q&A uh, down at the bottom of your screen. Um, one of the questions that we had was, um, do you have any sense of whether folks in Nathan's generation knew about this history, reflected on this history as they were uh, making their own paths in the world. We have not found any documentation, uh, any letters or diary entries in which Nathan's generation mentions it at all. Um, however, one of his brothers is named John, and there is a second named Jonathan, and that is traditional for the time to, you know, the, the naming tree. Um, so, I mean, I would imagine being that he was such a prominent figure in the Beverly, Massachusetts area that they would have had to know. Uh, one of the brothers becomes a minister in Massachusetts. Uh, so word of mouth, I don't think that it was really buried that far down. Okay, and then we have another question about um, how this research is conducted. Like, how did you, how, what sources do you use? I, I imagine the uh, the firsthand accounts are huge, right? But what other research uh, resources would you recommend for people? Um, I can provide a link for those who who um, who signed up for this talk. Um, I do have 
a list of, uh, I just have done a lot of, lot of reading and a lot of people uh, tends to come into the homestead with family lore. And I always try to do my research before ever repeating what somebody says has been passed down through the family. So uh, there are a lot of books out there. I will say I have read uh, Reverend Hale's book. Um, it is not an easy read. It is very dry with uh, a lot of old English language within it. Uh, but uh, so I'm just constantly looking for more sources and I can share our sources. All right, that is awesome. So those are the questions that have come in. If anyone has a last minute question, Anne Marie and I will be hanging out here for a minute so you can feel free to drop it into the Q&A or the chat function. Um, I do just wanna say thank you, thank you, Anne Marie for sharing this presentation. Um, I think that these connections to other locations and to other generations are so interesting to think about um, to kind of expand how we look at the people who lived in the houses that we uh, operate as museums today. Um, and we are just so grateful to you for sharing your knowledge. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, and uh, so if you're- And thank uh, you to everybody who oh. signed up to come. Thank you. Yes, hugely grateful for that. Um, we do have another program coming up next month that focuses on the Bellamy Faraday House and some of the stories that we don't tell you if you go there for a tour. So if you, even if you've been to that property, this will be a really great program to uh, join us for. And uh, you can register for that so that you get the emails about it um, on our website, ctlandmarks.org. Um, and that will feature Peg Scheimer, who is our site administrator over at the Bellamy Faraday House. Um, as I mentioned, we will be sending out a recording of this program. Uh, so stay tuned. You can share with your friends. Um, and the Nathan Hale Homestead is actually open for tours through the end of October. So if you have not been and you would like to learn about the descendants of Reverend John Hale, uh, you can come visit us there. Please come see us. We'd love to see you. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to turn off the recording now.